Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Environment Forum at the Mahindra Humanities Center. I'm Ian Miller, co-convener of the forum with Robin Kelsey, professor of photography and dean of arts and humanities here at Harvard. This is the final event of ours for the semester. We'll continue in the spring with a set of exciting events, always exciting events here at the Forum, but these are particularly great. I'm excited to, to uh, welcome these two scholars to campus. The first is a discussion with the historian of science, Deborah Cohen, from Yale, recently moved from Barnard, on the uses and abuses of historical thinking in the climate change debate and in the manufacture of climate knowledge. And then second, we'll have a very welcome visit uh, from a familiar figure here at Harvard, the eminent psychiatrist Robert J. Lifton, who has turned his gaze from the causes and costs of conflict and violence, issues that he's been dealing with since he was involved in the U.S. occupation of Japan in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, to questions of climate change and environmental damage. It promises to be a terrific lineup for the spring, and it would not be possible, I have to say, I'm very happy to say, without the unwavering support of the Mahindra Center. I'd like to begin by thanking Homi Baba, director of the center, Steve Beal, and Sarah Razor, as well as the full staff at the center. You make all of this possible, you bring all of us together, and it's somehow invisible because you do it so well each and every time. Thank you very much. I'm also grateful to all of you for joining us here at the Forum. I'm absolutely delighted with the turnout. On a, I thought, it's raining. The climate has impacted our talk about climate. No one's going to show up. And here we are, almost overflowing the room. It's just perfect. Thank you for joining us on a cold, rainy night uh, for what promises to be a warm and engaging talk. I'm also grateful uh, to, or I'd like, to, I'm pleased to introduce tonight's, excuse me, to introduce uh, our work in the series, as well as to welcome Professor Michael Pewitt, who will join us for the Q&A following the talk, and who has kindly agreed to introduce tonight's speaker, Prasenjit Dwara. Prasenjit joins us from Duke, and he's here to talk about issues related to his most recent book, The Crisis of Global Modernity, Asian Traditions, and I have to shill for the book because it's a wonderful book. Pick it up. It's incredibly provocative and a great read. The Crisis, crisis of Global Modernity, Asian Traditions, and a Sustainable Future. Now, to my eye, the purpose of the forum is fairly simple. It's not all that complicated. Our work is, at the end of the day, an effort to situate the humanities and the social sciences in the natural world. I emphasize, emphasize the preposition because it's meant to carry a double meaning in this case, signaling both the immersion, thank you, I saw that that moved, signaling both the immersion of our work as humanists into an encompassing material world, a kind of ecological embeddedness that is sometimes lost in our focus on the realm of ideas and texts, and second, the recognition that work in these fields from the arts and fiction making to history and the social sciences offers crucial resources as we struggle to come to terms with the reality of our changing climate and our changing world. Now, it seems that lately, many of us want to see the first of these meetings as more radical, more interesting, more cutting edge. Frankly, to use the term that my graduate advisor used to, used to use, sexier intellectually, right? The material turn and the new materialism seem to be everywhere these, these days. Ubiquitous phrases uh, used in ways that signal a sea change in how we are trying to think as scholars. I sit on the board for a nationally competitive graduate fellowship down in New York. I go down every year, and it's a signal of the kind of durability and applicability and kind of trendiness of this term. Uh, it turns out that something like 60% of the finalist applications for the fellowship last year used the term entanglement, meant to for, use, signal this embeddedness, this material term. It's become the new buzzword of our age, it seems like. The way discourse was when I was a graduate student <laughs> in the 1980s. We all read Foucault. We were all engaged in the cultural turn. Now we're turning back to the material world, it seems. It's everywhere in humanistic discourse. We can see, them in, see that in fairly theoretical or philosophical ways in a growing body of work 
critical work in particular on ontology, the so-called ontological turn, and in a renewed sense of urgency around more traditional questions such as agency, now distributed in a way it was not in our writing, space and place in a richer ecological sense. In more immediate and apparent efforts, it's there in such uh, efforts as uh, our work on book history here at Harvard. Practiced by Ann Blair, Bob Darton, Leah Price, and others here on campus, scholarly work has never been immaterial, these folks remind us, not in the ways we like to pretend. They show us that the history of ideas is also a history of technology. In this case, one especially useful, portable, and durable technology, the book. We see it everywhere, and we see op-eds now in the Atlantic, the Washington Post, the New York Times, telling us it won't go away. Now, lately, I sometimes think that the second aspect of our mission, the more commonplace aspect, is more challenging. The material turn is underway. It has momentum, as is evident in the work of those brilliant graduate students who are cranking out grant applications every fall. We see it in our work. We hear it in the questions that come from our students in our classrooms. But what about the uses of the humanistic tradition as we struggle to come to terms with our changing global climate? How can the deep traditions, and I use that word advisedly and technically, the deep traditions, the legacies, histories, and cultures enshrined in literate canons from around the world help us to understand and act in this particular moment? How are history and the deep past useful today? How can we write, as Homi said in his eloquent introduction to our forum uh, hosting Naomi Oreskes, how can we learn to write in the first person in specific and personally meaningful ways about forces that so far exceed our individual capacity for representation or even comprehension? Forces and dynamics such as global ch climate change. What is the role of the humanities and scholars who practice the humanities in such a moment? Few places, perhaps no place, offers a greater depth of intellectual resources defined here as millennia of literate culture with which to confront these questions than China and East Asia, the locus of this evening's forum. And it's difficult to imagine two scholars who are better suited to usher us into that deep past than Michael Pewitt and Prasenjit Dwara. Michael will introduce Professor Dwara and this evening's talk, but I'm absolutely delighted to be able to <laughs> introduce him this evening. Michael is Walter C. Klein, Professor of Chinese History and Anthropology here at, ha at Harvard, and the author, co-author, editor and co-editor of four extremely well-received books with another quickly on the way. But he's probably best known at Harvard as simply one of the best teachers this school has ever seen. Michael is a genius <laughs> in the classroom. If you haven't watched him teach, sneak into the back of his lectures. <laughs> they are fabulous and they're electric and the reason is sitting right here. This is a professor who asks his students, <laughs> asks all of us, really, if you read his work, to live as the sages did, to put philosophy into practice, to see how it applies, to understand its contradictions as you think about the choices and values of your everyday life. His intellectual wor work in that sense defines that aspect of the forum's mission. That is, to summon the deep past, in this case, the Chinese past, the Asian past, into the service of the present using it to defamiliarize our world and to make new ways of being visible and viable. Please join me in welcoming Michael and welcome to the forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian, for the much too nice introduction. My deep thanks to you and Professor Kelsey for putting this together. This is such an extraordinary forum and it's a deep honor for me today to introduce Professor Prasenja Dora, the first time this year in the session that we'll be bringing in voices from Asia and, as we will see, with a voice that will enable us to do so in truly <coughs> extraordinary ways. Professor Dora has been for years one of the leading figures, not simply in helping us have a new understanding of Asia, but much more importantly 
importantly, allowing us to use the materials, the indigenous concepts in Asia to rethink our most fundamental assumptions, our most fundamental approaches, and rethink what we used to think of as the big questions, now posed in radically different ways. Prasenjit Dwar first broke onto the scene in, with his first book. It was called Culture, Power, and the State. It was an attempt to rethink state formation in China in the first half of the 20th century, but the way he does this is not the way everyone else was doing it, which is, of course, to look at how states operate. He actually begins at the rural level, shows over the course of 50 years the radical transformation in the rural areas affected by the state, and thereby makes an argument how we should understand a new state formation in China, but he makes it very clear this should lead us to rethink state formation in Asia in general and state formation throughout the entire world. In the subsequent decades since the book was published, this has become one of the key works in allowing us to rethink these processes of state formation. Immediately, he moves on to yet another work. This one is called Rescuing History from the Nation, arguing that, yes, most of our historiographies are dominated by accepted notions of the nation state. And many people at the time were saying we should work against this and deconstruct our notions of the nation state. Prasenja Dwar was the leader in saying, absolutely true, but then what do we do next? And the book was an attempt to actively rethink what history would mean if we did not take the nation state as the central focus. Here, too, we have an extraordinarily influential work that has really helped us reconceptualize the practice of history. Following was his third book, Sovereignty and Authenticity, an attempt to rethink our notions of sovereignty, the nation state, in Asia, but again, forcing it onto an international level, and here again, forcing a fundamental rethinking of our assumptions. And most importantly, his latest book, The Crisis of Global Modernity, our discussion for tonight, a truly extraordinary work in which he forces a complete rethinking, not only of the rise of modernity, which is not a minor topic in itself, <laughs> but even arguing that not just we need to reconceptualize modernity, but how would we redo history so we don't fall into the dangers of assuming a modernity narrative, even as we're trying to deny it? He comes up with a brilliant vision of history as circulation, then rereads the entire so called modern period through such a history. As he goes, he rethinks our fundamental assumptions about what secularized states are as they arose during this period rethinking why they arose, what they were really doing, what they were working against, and then perhaps most brilliantly of all, shows how this reconceptualization forces us, or I should even say inspires us, to rethink our notions of the circulation of religions that are ongoing, all of which is then used to make a strong, and I found incredibly powerful and moving argument, for how we can reconceptualize the ecological crisis precisely by rethinking our most fundamental assumptions, our most fundamental approaches, and making a sophisticated and brilliant argument for therefore what we in the humanities need to do to take part in that effort. We are therefore honored to have Prasenja Tuar here today to bring this brilliance to us as we're all trying to wrestle with these questions. And I therefore ask you to join me in giving our very warmest welcome to Professor Prasenjit Dwara. <laughs> it wasn't that bad, was it? It wasn't that bad. Well, we, you may as well just <laughs> listen to Michael. I mean, you know, I, I couldn't recognize myself there, but, uh, but that was uh, fabulous. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I'm very much humbled now, so, so please scale down your expectations. <laughs> uh, I, I'm very pleased, at any rate, to see uh, all of you here. Uh, every time I've come to Harvard over the last uh, God knows how many years, uh, it's been raining, but uh, people still show up. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't get rained out at any rate. Um, now, let's see. Uh, we, we, uh, I am going to extricate some, uh, some sacrifices from you because you've taken 15 minutes of my time <laughs> and it's a rather uh, long, long talk. So, good. give good. me a <laughs> good. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, let's see. This way, right? Is it moved? Yeah. Okay. So the the uh, talk is uh, based on the book which you've heard about and which I will.
plug again at the end, although it's not new anymore. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the crisis of global modernity. Uh, but it also uh, deals with some of my recent work uh, uh, that I'm working mostly with uh, Cambodian uh, activists and so on. And, uh, and also working with my good friends, uh, uh, Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm, who I'm very pleased to say are here. I was just at Yale last week, or the week before, where we were discussing sort of the methodology of, um, of trying to develop a methodology, an agenda of uh, uh, environmental humanities, particularly from the Asian context. Although that will not be the talk here, uh, given what the, the pre-talks that I've had with several of you, maybe in the discussion, we can uh, talk about that. So what is the problem? Can I read this? <laughs> OK. So um, what, uh, 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 as Michael sort of pointed out very, very well, uh, the, much of the problem has awoken to the climate change uh, 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 issue recently, and I think uh, environmental humanities is, of course, a, uh, uh, a reaction, a response to that. Can I get a kind of a full screen here? How do I do that? Um, can somebody help me? Uh, I, because it's half and, you know, my eyes are not as good as they used to be. Uh, is there? No, I mean, you know, here the screen itself, this, this laptop is divided into two with my future <laughs> slide, <laughs> which I don't need. Oh, it's in presenter view. It's right. in presenter view, so it should be in display settings. I wish I'm a Mac user, so I'm really useless. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Great, thank so, you. Okay. <laughs> you just want yours. I just screen. want my screen. No problem, sir. Yeah, I thought it Fingency would be bad. Technology. But I didn't want to mess. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. No <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, so the humanities have sort of responded to it, and we know that uh, the crisis is, uh, well, according to most uh, uh, scientists in the world, uh, is really a product of the overreach, of human overreach, of the modern goal of generating wealth by conquering nature, if uh, one can make a bold statement like that. Even so, many policy makers look to, you know, uh, they look, of course, to renewable energy, which is the one that is uh, most important. That is to say, most policymakers in, in much of the rest of the world. Uh, but, uh, but also look to geoengineering and uh, market mechanisms to address these problems. Now, uh, to begin with, I'm not opposed. I'm certainly not sympathetic. I think we need all that we can get to address uh, the problems of climate change that we have. Uh, but I think that geoengineering and market solutions, market uh, mechanisms, are really um, uh, have uh, many, many side problems, including uh, the issues of delivery, of governance, of, you know, many plans sort of sit in the drawers of scientists' desks, or in the files, I guess. And uh, because of problems of governance, of cultural understanding, of society, and most of all, of course, of uh, political ecology and the politics of these kinds of issues. And of course, many uh, also geoengineering solutions uh, can have all kinds of disastrous side effects that require, once again, civil society uh, and what is now known as citizen science uh, to be able to address. So uh, renewable energy is, of course, great, uh, but I don't think that it can still uh, alleviate our current rate of accelerating climate change and rising ocean levels. Uh, I follow closely the, uh, economic, uh, ec uh, the ecological economist, uh, Tim Jackson, who, uh, who has a th treadmill argument. He is the, uh, the director of the Sustainable uh, uh, Economy Program in the UK and is very involved with the UN as well. Uh, and uh, Tim Jackson argues uh, from a kind of a, a semi-Marxist uh, perspective that uh, as long as we remain on the treadmill of uh, accelerating production, the reduction of uh, polluting energy inputs will simply increase its use for higher production and profits. And at the same time, increase the exploitation of other uh, resources. I, I think one of the best 
examples in recent, recent times is the rare earth uh, uh, quest, which is really digging very deep in many parts of the world and also producing, of course, abysmal conditions. But it's necessary for your and my cell phones and for everything else uh, that we're doing with uh, contemporary technology. So ultimately, it seems to me that we will need a kind of value change in the world that can limit the mentality of increasing GDP and consumption, that treadmill. At the same time, of course, we need to address the problem of poverty. Because after all, we cannot stand up when the third world stands up and says, you know, OK, you've had your goods. What about us, you know? And so I think uh, the, any notion of environmental justice has to build that in, in a way that the Paris uh, uh, Climate Conference did not necessarily address. Uh, ecologists and people like Tim Jackson have tried valiantly to show that the two, the, the problem of alleviation of poverty and um, uh, the alleviation or at least addressing mitigation of uh, climate change uh, are not necessarily uh, contradictory, particularly if we are committed, if we do not remain committed to incessant GDP growth as the only measure of prosperity. And, you know, they consider many different, how it is that our very notion of prosperity has become reduced to this kind of GDP growth and is only measured in those kinds of terms, which of course in turn involves increasing consumption uh, at, uh, uh, at a rapid rate and so on. And uh, they, he talks about, uh, he considers Amartya Sen's, uh, who is still at this university, right? Yes. Okay, good. Could never figure out where he is at any <laughs> single point. But uh, Amartya Sen's capabilities ideas, which I think are also very interesting, but of course he has to, uh, he has to, uh, what should I say, uh, adapt them to the conditions uh, uh, of uh, what it means to have a fulfilling life uh, without necessarily going on, uh, by, by increasing capabilities, uh, but not having uh, uh, sort of, of access to the full resources of the world all the time. That is with limited thresholds, right? And uh, one of the things that uh, Tim Jackson argues is that, uh, you know, as long as we can, he says that you can have a satisfactory life to fulfill all kinds of uh, purposes with a, what he calculates, a $15,000 per capita income in, in the world. And if the world could, could maintain it at that level, you could find many different ways of uh, uh, achieving your capacities and capabilities and fulfilling your desires for many things. It almost sounds like when Marx talks about go fishing in the morning and hunting in the evening and things like that in his communist utopia, but with a much, but you may have to do fishing, right? <laughs> and, and not go around with your uh, latest gadget. Um, <laughs> fly fishing, perhaps, even. <laughs> Uh, so my, my work is really uh, now, uh, the paper here is designed to probe this problem of value change. And uh, just to, you know, I don't know anything about Costa Rica except what I've given you. I was giving a class lecture and I, was, I, I stumbled onto it. And it seems to me the perfect example, and I'm sure that if, you're, if there are Latin Americanists here, you will correct me and show me how many problems there are in Costa Rica. But, you know, they have a per capita GDP of 12,000 USD. They have 5% of the world's biodiversity, but the population is 0.06% of the world's population, right? Uh, they have 25% of their land is protected, as you can see in this map here. And 50% of the land is forested. It's not, a, a lot of it is new growth forest. It's not primeval forest or something, but nonetheless, they have it. And um, uh, the Happiness Planet, uh, Happy Planet Index uh, discovered it to be, uh, uh, rated it as the greenest and happiest country for three years in a row in the world. It has displaced Bhutan by, by far and also many of the Scandinavian countries uh, in those indices. And uh, so, uh, and, and it's not just the Happiness Planet, Gallup Poll also found the Central American nation to have the highest level of well-being in the world. So it's not, it's not some pie in the sky 
uh, goal that these guys are talking about. I think, uh, um, you know, a lot has to be done, but there is, it's, it's in the realm of possibility. So what is my argument? I argue that we begin to see the glimmers of value change in a convergence of historical trends of marginal local communities in Asia and elsewhere in the developing world seeking to conserve their livelihood resources uh, and coming together with uh, modern groups committed to environmental protection. Right? This convergence, I argue, is a kind of emergent phenomenon in the fashionable sense of the word emergent of uh, Whitehead and others. Uh, if, uh, but it is, of course, a very weak force. But it is poised, I think, on something very globally significant. It, they reflect a kind of philosophical attitude that, uh, and the possibilities of a sustainable life in opposition to the neoliberal model that we have, um, that we have lived with now. The neoliberal capitalist, or even what I would say, uh, the uh, national modernization cosmology uh, focused on the conquest of nature and to feed unending wealth. As I said, it's a weak position. There, is, uh, there are lots of weaknesses within this oppositional mosaic and we can talk about them. I'm not going to dwell on the weaknesses so much this time. I'll mention them. Uh, but my, 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 my goal is really to try and see what this kind of position is. What kind of, is it possible to sort of track it, to trace it? Um, and uh, to view it from world historical patterns that are tied to ideas of transcendence. And my final argument is that I do believe there is a concept, a new concept of sacrality of nature that uh, is beginning to emerge and that it has social, discursive, as well as some legal underpinnings globally. Uh, but you just have to have the right optic to see how it's working. So I really want to draw attention to this possibility in the world. So um, I, I go into some depth about uh, some of the theoretical concepts in the book and that have been very important for me to understand this phenomenon. I use very much uh, or a version of, it's a not the orthodox idea of transcendence that Axel Age sociologists uh, developed, including our teacher, uh, Ben Schwartz, uh, was a very important part of this. In fact, I first heard about it from him. Uh, but I have followed the uh, literature on transcendence. Uh, I see it uh, not uh, in the traditional terms of a god or something like that, but uh, really a position of knowledge, what I call a meta-epistemic position of knowledge. I mean, you know, it is something that people have with material consequences, whether or not that uh, transcendent position is there or not is not significant to me. It, it works as if it is important for the people who see it, right? But, uh, and a lot of philosophers have now been coming around to it. Charles Taylor has become a big advocate. Even Jürgen Habermas, who is, of course, your ultimate rationalist, post-Marxist rationalist, has come around to this point of view. And he, of course, is uh, super enthusiastic about it. He talks about this is the, the transcendent position, which is a position from outside the world, really allows you to get a synoptic view of the world as a whole, distinguishing the flood of phenomena from underlying essences. And then he goes on about how you get the difference between health and medicine, law, and this. It, it's just, uh, I think he overdoes it, but uh, uh, because it's not entirely that. But it is very much the capacity for uh, transcendence, if I had to define it, it's the capacity of abstraction from the here and now, right? So it is the capacity, and uh, it emerges, of course, at the time when you begin to get empires in the 6th century BC uh, that spread across, and that's what the axial axis, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with this, refers to the axial age across the 6th century onwards, uh, which, which, uh, where you have philosophers who posit this uh, uh, meta-epistemic locus. And uh, it does refer to the point at which there is the condition of universalism becomes possible, something beyond the here and now. And uh, it also generates a reflexivity of the self and its position in relation to this world, right? What is my 
status, what is the meaning of my life in this, how do I relate to it, how do I relate to uh, the world around it, and how do I relate to power, to material power in the here and now. How does this alternative source of moral authority, which is beyond this world, relate to uh, power in the world? So it's a source of ethics and ethical power. And uh, this, uh, this, this transcendent role has been completely underestimated in historical uh, studies. And, uh, uh, but if you look at it everywhere, it's everywhere. From the earliest periods, you begin to get establishment institutions, where there's the church and the church-state relations, the mandate of heaven, Brahmin power. Uh, these are, of course, become establishment. I mean, the whole idea is that once you have a hold on transcendent power, then political power wants to grab that as well, right? It's always, uh, but then you also have oppositional movements that are based on this, whether this is, you know, the most important is the Protestant movement that we know about, but there are all through history, whether it's Franciscans, Sufis, Buddhists against Brahmins, Buddhist Jains, the Bhakti movement, the Neo-Confucian movement, the Taoists, uh, Thoreau, Gandhi, Martin Luther King. I mean, all these people really work on this alternative source of moral authority, right? Uh, and uh, the problem with the Axel Age is that they thought it happened just once, right? But it's a recurrent phenomenon. And it's, in that sense, it becomes a historical process. It's very much part of the historical process. Uh, and it's very important for renewal, so social renewal. So, uh, and uh, part of the argument in the book is that there is a big difference between transcendence in the Abrahamic societies and in the non-Abrahamic societies, and uh, the book goes on to discuss a great deal of this difference. But I do want to say that what Max, Weber, Max Weber called the intellectual religions of the East did not have an omnipotent God in that transcendent position, right? Uh, but more rational techniques of cultivation, whether these are ethical, self-cultivation is a big term in Neo-Confucianism, yogic, meditative, in approaching transcendent authority rather than pure faith or just sacralization. So there is a measure of rationality that Weber, of course, always real recognized that underlay the sac sacred authority that was involved in there. So although the major problems of the world manifest themselves, the environmental problems that we have today, locally and can best be addressed perhaps locally without a universal vision that the transcendent position gives us, that locus can give us, it becomes a problem of kicking the can down the road, right? It becomes NIMBY. We don't want this chemical factory here, take it somewhere else. That doesn't address that. And this is happening all over the world. Today, uh, Thailand is, produce, it, is constructing its most polluting industries in that Burmese uh, uh, strip, you know, which adjoins it. That's where it does it, because there is no movement in Burma against it in that space. There is on the Maitson Dam and the Irrawaddy River and so on. There's huge civil society movement, but not in that space. And there's nobody there to complain. So, you, so what I argue in the book is, is a position of, for dialogical transcendence where you can have this back and forth, which becomes very difficult, more, much more difficult in the Abrahamic traditions, which has a much purer sense of the transcendent. So um, one of the principal problems in addressing the universal or planetary dimensions is, of course, nationalism, something I've railed about for about 30 years now, <laughs> uh, though I've become much more sensible towards it, I think. And the problem of national sovereignty, which prevents uh, collaborative solving of common problems. And I'll just show you one picture of the Himalayan rivers. And it locks national leaders into this whole competitive GDP and resource control game, right? So one of the things, the other thing that I try to do in this book is also talk about how uh, the idea of national sovereignty is so closely tied up with the idea of modern national history, of modern history, which of course began as national histories. And uh, that uh, it, uh, it has the role by talking about, by seeing history as linear and tunneled uh, from origins to destiny. Uh, it, it mean, becomes a means of claiming sovereignty, right? This is our people, our land, our tradition, our cultures, you get out. And besides, you cannot interfere. Uh, so it prioritizes national interests way above the planetary interests, right? 
In a way, the universal transcendence of pre-national religions has been blocked at the nation as the highest level of transcendent, transcendence and mobilized for tribalist and capitalist competition. I mean, this is my general take on nationalism in general. So what I try to do, uh, as you pointed out, Michael, is that uh, I, um, I try to substitute not circulation, but circulatory histories uh, for the linear tunnel histories of nations and civilizations with the idea of circulatory histories. Uh, and now I'm trying to, I'm developing a paper on it. And one of the, you know, one of the common uh, sort of ways in which uh, uh, I thought could be very usable was the Deleuze and Guattari idea of rhizomatics, right? Which were the same thing can appear in different places simultaneously. But I'm now much more persuaded, although I have to study much more physics for that, to talk about in terms of currents, ocean currents, and, uh, and the whole sort of... Um, uh, ocean physics, in a way, and how that also redistributes. And it ties back, of course, to the natural sphere in very interesting kinds of ways. So does the rhizome. But, um, but I'm still working on that. <laughs> so maybe in a year. Uh, so what is, what is circulatory history? Events have effects that disperse over space and time, right? A major war can have distant uh, effects on prices or political alliances in third, fourth, uh, 20,000 other places. And I'll just give a personal uh, narrative, not a personal, a personal historical uh, narrative, which is the case of the Ahums. The Ahums, uh, I come from a part of India called uh, Assam in northeast India. Here you can see that, uh, where is the pointer? Is the pointer working? Do I point here? Yeah, there it is. This is, yeah. this is Assam, where you have the Brahmaputra River out here, right? Now, and this is, you can see, uh, it is Yunnan, right? Just around here, Yunnan. The Ahums came to the Brahmaputra region in the 13th century. They were part of the Dali kingdom or the Dailue kingdom uh, in, until the 14th century, which was an independent Buddhist kingdom, uh, not uh, controlled by the Chinese empires, until the Mongols come. And then the Mongols uh, overrun it, and the Thais uh, go on. It's not exactly true, but it's pretty close to the truth. Um, uh, go on to create Thailand, what is now the, Thai, uh, Thai, the Thais of Thailand. Whereas uh, one of the very important vassal groups uh, comes, uh, come uh, over, go to the west, to the Brahmaputra River, called the Ahoms. And uh, manage, they have very good riverine technologies. And they keep out the Mughals, they keep out, and they, it's not till the 19th century when the British conquer them that you have it. So they also import, they Hinduize after a while, they Sanskritize, and they import people from North India. And, uh, you know, people of my class background from Assam will say, oh, yes, we are from those, those families. Yeah? Whether or not we are there from there, nonetheless, it is the Mongol invasion that made us who we are there right now, right? So talk about the effects of uh, circulatory histories. Um, now, the, of course, and, you know, I always take the example of, it's also narratives which change with the dispersal of the event and the effects of the events, the narratives also change. So, you know, at, at the time of the 1940s, you had Japanese imperialism, you know, uh, celebrating its great victories, which today is being turned against it very much by those very people, places where it is, whether it's Taiwanese aboriginals or Koreans or Chinese uh, and so on. And uh, there may even come a time when... Uh, well, they've resisted it so far, when Japanese school children are reading textbooks about their imperial history that has a very different view from what it was at a certain time. So there is a certain sort of um, looping back to events and their concatenations with different meanings and endings. So this is the way in which history really circulates, is circulatory, both in... I also give this other example of Marxism coming into China from several different sources, right? Japan, Russia, uh, France, and so on. But uh, when it comes in, it, of course, the, the local force transforms it, becomes a peasant revolution, right? Mao Zedong thought. 
but then, and that goes out then, cycles out to the rest of the world. But what does it become now? Essentially, if you look at what Maoism is today, it is a tribalist movement. You have it among Chiapas, you have among Central Asians, you have uh, uh, among uh, Central India, in Nepal and these kinds of places. They're essentially tribalist movements. And uh, so you have these kinds of transformations, but the reference is still back to a certain type of Marxism, right? That's going around and shaping societies and reshaping societies. So that's the kind of thing I want to talk about. The important point here is that history is a shared planetary heritage. We need to realize transcendence at a planetary level to match the global nature of human history and the problems humans have created, right? So uh, it's really going to be very difficult to, to, uh, uh, to validly depict uh, national histories as the basis of the kind of sovereignty that opposes uh, all kinds of uh, interventions that are necessary. So here, I mean, you know, this, uh, this has been well studied. The Himalayan rivers, as you know, uh, have uh, produced uh, life for uh, um, uh, over a billion people, billion and a half, and many, many species uh, around in the Circum Himalayan region. And uh, what is happening with glacial melting, river diversions, which is happening in China and now also in India, and um, a dam building, most of all, are endangering the sources of livelihoods of these people. And intergovernmental cooperation is absolutely essential. But you find that there are three countries in the world in particular who refuse to share information and cooperate internationally on river knowledge. And you know, how much sedimentation is taking place, how much is, you know. And they are, as you would guess, one is China, one is Turkey, and the third is Rwanda. And you know what they all have in common? Any, any guesses? Rivers originate in those countries. <laughs> I was saying they're giving this talk and a Tibetan student got up and said, oh, that would be Tibet, <laughs> wouldn't it? <laughs> and so there was, a, yes, I guess if you can make that claim. Uh, so, so this is a huge problem, right? That you, uh, you cannot find out, it's not, it's not easy to have, and the Mekong Commission, which is among the most active, and there's a lot of work on Mekong, uh, both social act uh, uh, civil society activists and political activists, is been one of the most successful, but still way, way uh, below what should, be, uh, what should be happening there. So is it possible to elevate sustainability to a transcendent level, right? It seems to me, uh, you know, most people will say, well, it's, you know, corporations and capitalism and so on. Well, certainly that is uh, definitely an issue. But uh, I think the more proximate issue is the problem of national leaders and how they're so tied in to the ideologies of national interests. Uh, for example, you had the proposal of uh, Mutsuyoshi Nishimura, who was the, the first, uh, the, in, the, in the Kyoto Protocol, he was the chief climate negotiator for Japan. And uh, he had a very simple, a very elegant proposal. He said the government should collectively own a capped carbon budget of 660 billion gigatons of uh, CO2 in total emissions between 2010 and 2050. And then he had this idea that these credits will be auctioned off on a polluter pay principle. And th those payments will then uh, uh, seek to recover uh, the damages that were caused. And he had all kinds of provisions for handicapped, uh, for, uh, handicapped provisions for developing societies and so on. And it was something that certainly the NGOs who have been among the main forces behind all these climate change talks, had agreed on and they had a principal agreement on this kind of thing but it was always the national governments that uh, would claim national mitigation uh, circumstances and so on and for a long time it was china and the us you know the us saying you are you're polluting totally much more and the china was saying well you've done it historically per capita you're so much more and so on then finally we get to some kind of uh, some kind of first step uh, with the uh, Paris 2015 UN uh, Climate Change Conference, what is known as COP21. 
And that was a huge moment of celebration, although it was just a first stage because it was all voluntary and it, and it didn't have anything to do with uh, uh, your capacities uh, to implement any of this. And then we come to a stage now when that's off the table with the US, right? So, uh, and we have to see now what's, so it's always, you know, many steps backwards at every point. So, Although, as I said, government and intergovernment agencies are officially behind this effort, it is really global civil society that is the main pressure group behind them. NGOs, quasi-government uh, agencies like IPCC and things like that, private public initiatives, all of these have been very important in this whole movement in the world. And not least among these is the transformation of religious societies in the world. Uh, uh, now, of course, the Pope has gotten very big into it, but uh, until recently it was many Asian societies which had uh, uh, Asian religious group which embed dialogical but authoritative uh, realm for self-formation and value renewal, right? So I, what I want to discuss is the tendency towards the converging goals for both uh, religious and non-religious uh, social groups, civil societies, linked by th this idea of ecological spirituality, which I'm going to talk about now. First, let me talk a little bit about cultural circulations uh, in the Anthropocene. So it's part of the circulatory history moment, right? Uh, one of the examples I give in my book that people seem to enjoy much is the idea of uh, Ram Mohan Roy, who is often considered the father of modern India in 18... 31, he's, he was in Bristol, he was a unitar he was a, uh, he was a Vedantist, but he saw an equation between the Vedanta and uh, Unitarianism. And he, uh, he was in Bristol, and I found this letter circulating in Peabody, in the, in the Peabody archive, in the Salem archive, uh, that uh, has this little fragment that Ram Mohan Roy will come in to, to Salem, and so we are circulating this lock of hair of his, uh, so in order to sort of celebrate his saintliness and things like that. And uh, he couldn't come because he dies just then in 1831. And so, but then apparently that opened up a whole archive which showed how Thoreau and Emerson had read some of his translations. And there were other translations also, but had read some of his stuff and were preparing to sort of, it. and this led very much to the kind of Thoreauvian transcendentalism, right, which in turn, and civil disobedience, which in turn influences someone like Gandhi, although Gandhi doesn't fully admit it, but through Tolstoy, it influences Gandhi. And Gandhi then, of course, influences Martin Luther King, right? So you get this sort of looping back and forth the whole time, which, uh, which is part of this cultural circulations, right, of what we can call spirituality, right? So they, are, they have typically been thought of as countercultural movements among hippies or urban groups or rural reconstructions in East Asia. I think they're very important and in the Trans-Pacific. But I think they're developing a new relevance as their causes become tied to the most marginal groups in uh, Asian societies and I would say in Latin American societies and African societies to a lesser extent as well. So on the one hand, you have American spiritualist movements that embrace a holistic view of nature, from Thoreau to deep ecologists to you know, world wildlife to all of these kinds of agencies, both, I would say, on the extreme wilderness uh, ang side, but also the corporatist types like Conservation International and so on, who have, I think also have some very interesting ideas. So, uh, and they, and, but they are forging linkages with uh, groups that are developing around Gandhian ideas, around uh, Buddhist forest monks, among Taoist temples, and others as well. So at first glance, this seems like little rivulets that are going around. But I think one of the things that is really transforming them is this hyperconnectedness of our age. Right? And I'll talk a little bit about how this kind of the new civil society, that is, the new media civil society, which also has such destructive effects, can also create new types of allegiances and alliances uh, that, are, that give it a certain flexibility and resilience, I think. You can just look at Hong Kong, the way it's been resilient. Uh, 
what they do is these different types of movements that are converging, I think they converge upon a non-binary philosophical attitude with consequences not only for lifestyle changes, but for the ecological future of the planet. As I keep saying, it is a very weak force, but a very resilient form of politics that networks across the global space of the new media to achieve some of its goals. I'll give you some examples of that. First, we, uh, just a little explanation on the term spirituality. The way I define spirituality, also taken uh, in collaboration with Peter Van der Veer and others, is that really it is a residual realm for the transcendent uh, that comes, that emerges uh, with the global trend towards secularization, privatization of religion, the deinstitutionalization, and particularly the laicization, especially in Europe that happens here, which is, I think, at the root of the green movement and so on as well. Modern spirituality as such is a new sphere in historical society, which is derided as dreamy, but important repository. And, and we know that it was in the West, it was started very much with the Unitarians, the Theosophists, New Age spirituality, and so on. And as I've discussed, in North America, ecological spirituality, John Thoreau, I mean, uh, Thoreau's uh, uh, spirit insights were carried particularly by people like John Muir, Aldo Leopold, of course, Rachel Carson's and all those people, Arne Ness, and today has emerged as a significant American environmental movement, although it has many different branches. And you already begin to see the hookup with Asian environmentalist thought and uh, or proto-environmentalist thought with uh, uh, American Buddhists and others, right? Like uh, Ga uh, Gary Snyder, Alan Watts and others. Today, modern associational groups and circles have also grown in Asia, Latin America and Africa who seek to protect the environment and join with the people who are really most immediately and most powerfully affected by climate change. That is marginal indigenous traditional communities who have been bearing the brunt of the ecological devastation of their world. These marginal communities often tend to view nature as sacred, though not necessarily, I, we shouldn't romanticize them, but they often need to view it as sacred in order to preserve what they have, the little that they have. And they often use and they, they, they employ the sacrality to protect it. You know, if you look at tree hugging movements and so on, these have very much to do with their local notions of what uh, nature is about and you know the biggest environmental movement in India took off with the Chipko movement which is a tree hugging movement of 1972 right and and spawned a huge uh, movement from there. Uh, note also I mean this this kind of alliance is not just happening in the developing world and I will give you an example of the Dakota excess pipeline which could have had a huge impact you know until uh, I think it was January uh, the uh, Army Reserve Corps of Engineers had agreed that this will not take place in this Dakota country, right? And it was only with the new president, with our unnamed president, who, uh, where this was reversed. So if it had been pursued, you know, it could have had a rolling effect. I think it's set back now. I don't think it's going to disappear. But you did have a lot of people uh, uh, mobilize around it. And there's a lot of indigenous symbolism and sort of nature, uh, sacrality and so on going on here as well. Now, within the Asian traditions, we have theologically in Indic, Chinese and indigenous peoples cosmology, the sacredness of nature is of course a byproduct of, of a perspective integrating social, moral and natural order, what in Chinese is known as Tian Ren He Yi, the organic unity. And you know, this is of course now something that, has f that was forgotten for the last hundred years, but is coming back in a big way, not least due to some of uh, Professor Pewitt's efforts, I'm sure, <laughs> since uh, he has such an impact on the most I impactful class <laughs> in the US. Um, so, but also I should say that uh, uh, John and uh, Mary Evelyn have left, but uh, uh, this, this, the whole relation, the whole study of religion and environment begins at Harvard with Mary Evelyn Tucker and uh, John Grimm, who produced uh, ten volumes of uh, a, uh, 
world religions and the environment, right, uh, in the 90s, I think it was. Uh, so they were really ahead of their time in many ways. What draws these diverse currents and phenomena is their anti-dualism, the idea that you cannot have an, uh, you know, an integrated and organic view, cannot operate on the assumption that humans and nature are a binary, that humans can, in fact, conquer nature as something and rather see nature as very much part of yourself. I'm sure you've heard a lot about this in uh, your discussions here before, so I won't bore you with uh, those details. But I do have uh, lots of examples here, um, which I don't think we need to go into since uh, time is uh, short. But one of the very important uh, uh, activists in all these in Asian religions are, in fact, the uh, the uh, Thai, Cambodian, Laotian Buddhist monks. These are forest monks who have, and I, I'm spending a lot of time with the Cambodian uh, monks and the local communities who have now sort of taken over from the monks. But the monks are also still very important as uh, they have this uh, ceremony of ordinating trees, right? And uh, uh, this uh, ceremonial robing of trees and so on which uh, and have unleashed a very powerful uh, movement against deforestation and dam building in those uh, regions. And the Thai Buddhist monk uh, Bhikkhu Buddhadasa, of course, puts it very simply. He says, once, uh, the way he relates it is that one's realization of the interconnected of all, interconnectedness of all things and life forms, which are transient and changeable, will help deflate one's ego, knowing that everyone is one and the same, being subject to the same natural laws. His spirituality rejected specific religious identification. So it was very much a sp the spirituality mode, this uh, so non-institutionalized religion, this deinstitutionalized notion of something spiritual. And he was the, one of the most important, I think, inspirations for the forest monk environmental movements. The other place that this is very important is Taiwan. Taiwan has one of the most dynamic civil societies in Asia today. And within that, uh, the Buddhist groups are very powerful. You've all heard of Tsiji, but there's Faku, there is Fokuang Shan, there are many others. And all of them have as one of their central planks, the central plank in most, Huan Bao, which is protect the environment. And you know, you may have individual critiques of what they do or what they don't and how much they give in and how much they don't. But there are also some very powerful uh, uh, thinkers among some of these. I have worked on one or two of them as well. Um, so, and uh, anyway, there's a lot more here. I don't think we need to go into all of this. But I do want to sort of try and understand, try and see how we can understand these the relationship of these religions to this, what is ultimately a new project, right? The environmental protection. You can't say that Taoism is interested in nature, therefore it's a smooth, continuous flow. So we really have to change our notion of historical understanding. It's not one of substantial transition from the substance of one thing to a substance of another. It's if we look at it from the philosophical idea of emergence, uh, then you know that uh, when a historical event or process impacts a social formation, it affects an emergence which combines both the prevailing factor and the new thing. But the interesting historical problem is that the new phenomenon seeks to justify itself only in terms of the old, right? So this is the narrative uh, challenging, as it were, the circulation, right? And, and I think that we've had, you know, all of deconstruction has been based on this this separation, right, your claim. And I think we should really go beyond that and recognize with people like Paul Ricoeur and so on that the important thing is the pertinence. If these people feel impelled to do something that is a good cause, right, and they connect it with something that they can see was there, then that's good enough, right? What is the pertinence? And does the pertinence have persuasive power, right? So I think uh, this is uh, something uh, uh, very important that, and here I just want to uh, talk about, and I'm also indebted once again to Mary Evelyn for this. Uh, Pope Francis' June 2015 encyclical on care for our common home. This is a very radical document and likely to have a huge impact because it's going to be taught in all the Catholic schools all around the world, and uh, which integrates ecology and justice. 
And it's very radical because popes earlier had made kind of environmental noises earlier, but they stayed within the framework of the stewardship argument. Now, those of you who are in environmental humanities will be familiar with Lynn White's critique of Christianity as something that sees nature as something given by God to humans to do whatever you like with it, right, for your bounty. Uh, and the, the, the response of the church to that uh, kind of critique is that, well, God gave it to humans to be a steward, of, to steward it, right? So there's still a duality, but it's uh, one of care. And uh, what this pope does is that he does refer, for various reasons, to uh, many earlier pope statements and things that, but he's changing the underlying argument. It's not about stewardship or anything. It is tied very much on a very different concept of what is the divine uh, will, right? He's it's talking about, he invokes Mother Earth, he invokes uh, Francis of Assisi, and uh, he really refers to integral ecology, connecting humans to the environment and to the evolutionary process, right? So he's making these radical changes framed within, of course, a hermeneutic tradition, which he has to. So, um, but it really gives you the sense of the pertinence. Is it pertinent or not? How is it going to be accepted? And how long, we don't know how long this pope will last, but uh, you know, there are many forces working against him. But I think he's, he's turning out to be one of the most interesting figures of our time. Of course, I, I've, uh, we've talked also about uh, India and the Hindu groups that are fashioning themselves also in this response. Of course, here there's a problem that you get Hindutva also mixed in with the Hindu naturalism and so on. But, but those are one of the problems that we also do. I talked about Taiwan. So these l religious groups in Asia may be particularly suited to mediate between precarious local communities and this transcendent sustainability. In many parts of Asia, communities are resisting efforts to exploit or industrialize their natural resources by appealing to the sacrality of commons, right? Taoism, animism, Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism are utilized to protect resources by using terminology in China of Xiangtu, right? These are sort of sacred homelands, sacred groves. The whole, whole segments of Yunnan are now considered to be sacred forests of uh, marginal peoples and so on community forests, holy waters, especially in India, to oppose local environmental pollution. Now, apparently, talking about the environment, the legal underpinnings, the Ganges, polluted as it is, one of the most polluted rivers probably in the world, is now, it's now considered to be a crime, a legal crime uh, to pollute. The, no, what is it called? The Ganges is considered to be the equivalent of a person, has the rights of a person. So you can be charged for killing it. Right? So you can get that kind of sentence. And this, of course, in Latin America, you have a lot of these kinds of things for trees and so on. So I think there is a kind of legal underpinning to this idea of uh, the sacrality of natural uh, uh, creatures, I should say. And I've talked about several of these. Here is a conference I did in uh, just two or three months ago in Phnom Penh. And where it was really exciting because you could see, although it was started by these Prelang group, Prelang and there are two or three different forests, Priya Vihar, Prelang. These were uh, uh, forest dwellers, semi um, sort of Cambodian and semi tribal. They were Hindu Buddhist and they took on the movement. And once they started taking on the movement, the Buddhists joined them. And then local civil society joined them, and it became so prominent that you know it got the attention of global media, and suddenly it became a place where you know all levels of civil society uh, began to enter there. So they were all they set up very articulate, you know. At this particular, this this uh, monk to the to your right. By the way, he is in. Uh, I, f I have his name, Venerable uh, Ben Salut, I think. He's at U UVA, this, this uh, very articulate. He spent a lot of time in India, so he speaks English. And he, uh, he's very interesting. The other guy is probably, but he's, you know, uh, he, has, he says, I talk to Hun Sen all the time. So you don't want to go too close to a person like that. But the other guy is, <laughs> is, doesn't speak English, but he seems to be much more 
<laughs> with much greater integrity at any rate. He won't talk to Hun Sen. <laughs> uh, here are some of their pictures. Uh, here is, uh, this is also from the cover of my book. This is a very, these are these, this group that has been demonstrating since I think 20, long before 2010, but they got, came to attention in 2011. What they're doing, they call themselves Cambodia's avatars. And for them, avatar has a meaning in the Hindu Buddhist tradition. And what they did is they began to lead weekly demonstrations in the main square in Phnom Penh, where they would engage in their own forms of ritual theaters of protest, right? So it would be something, it would be ritualized, it would be theatrical, but it was a petition. It was their form of protest. And it attracted so much attention, and they took on the name Avatar, but not because of their local meaning, but because the movie. <laughs> so they're depicting themselves as, <laughs> as this creature below, right? <laughs> uh, so that is what this whole thing is all about. So, but that's a very interesting aspect of circulatory history, where it comes back again to you, but via the global media, right? And they got huge global attention on this. And I think there are several people, several groups that are studying the impact of Avatar. I don't know if they've started studying these. I don't think those two have been joined. It's a good cultural studies project. <laughs> I met several of these people. This is a dam activism. This is the Chipko movement, uh, the tree hugging movement that set off the whole environmental movement in India. Now, you know, people say that in China, the environment is uh, so, uh, in such, such bad shape. And most of the attention now is being placed on the government's efforts. And certainly, there has been a, a great deal of government effort uh, recently, but mostly in the realm of uh, renewable energy, and mostly in response to middle-class urban Chinese, right? So if you know the movie, Chai Jing's movie, Under the Dome, uh, which I, I should have included a discussion of it, but it's a very interesting movie, very powerful about how you cannot breathe in Beijing. Now you can't breathe in Delhi. But, uh, <laughs> and, and they did manage to clear that, but how? I mean, you know, it brought, it was very much a middle-class movie, a middle-class urban movie. And the whole rural areas continue to be very much kicking the can down the road, right? So you need a much greater kind of effort. And of course, in China, we know that the principal problem has to do with uh, the mixed messages. So the center, grandpa, is always says good things and even abolishes your taxes. But then the local government has to then pick up the, uh, the flag, right? Or pick up whatever you have to pick up. And they have profit motives, right? They have production targets and so on. So that's always a kind of tension. So, but nonetheless, uh, environmental NGOs have grown by leaps and bounds in China. They have become, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I have it here. I'll just come back to that. <laughs> I have to show you that. Uh, yeah, the numbers. In 2008, there were only, uh, there were 2,768 environmental NGOs. And by 2013, this had gone up to 8,000. This is one area of civil society, the green public sphere, which is permitted in China to some extent. And the reason it is permitted is because, in a way, they act as watchdogs. They're not activists so much as protectionists, right? They're watchdogs because the laws are all on the book. The laws are there, but it's really the implementation. So between the media and these and the ENGOs, you begin to get uh, five minutes more. Uh, you begin to get uh, some kind of uh, 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 legal results as well. Uh, but you know, it's a mixed story, of course, as you'd expect. I'll just go back to uh, this Taoism. Now, talking about pertinence and Taoism, uh, let me just. Uh, this is, Dao, you know, the Taoists in China in the post uh, Kaifang, the post opening years, have been much less successful in gaining attention than the Buddhists or the Confucianists, right? And there's no sort of natural global constituency for them. Natural is important. <laughs> and so when this uh, alliance of religions and conservations approached them, this is, by the way, this is an alliance that's based 
in Bath in England, and it's been very, very big. And it really begins to try and link up uh, traditional religions with uh, uh, conservation efforts. They agreed to join with them, and uh, they became, they declared uh, uh, Lao Tzu to be the Pahu uh, Shanghai Shen, right? So Lao Tzu has become the protector god of the environment, right? This is what he's become. He's officially <laughs> stated as that. And when you go, and they, although they don't have huge popular followings, they control all the Taoist temples in China. I just went to Mao Shan last summer. And they, uh, they control the temples, and you know, they are beautifully kept now. And you're not allowed to uh, burn more than three sticks of incense. You have to recycle. You have to use these, uh, uh, what do you call them, these photovoltaic, these, uh, what are they called? Anyway, uh, solar energy and things like that. And uh, they have strict uh, rules of all of these things. So at some level, it's working. And it is having a kind of an impact, you know. It's part of the public sphere here. And here is, a, I love this flag of theirs, which is yin yang and green, <laughs> right? The greening of Taoism. Uh, and then people have found all kinds of things that have survived the Chinese revolution and the cultural revolution, like these feng shui forests. All over, there's huge forest coverage. And feng shui, you know, people are just beginning to get into it because feng shui is just seen as some kind of urban, modern urban uh, fad, right? But in fact, there's, it's the uh, Tianren Hei, very much at the core of it is this idea of the organic nature of human and natural prosperity, that the two cannot be separated. So you have Chris Coggins is doing very good work on this with his whole team in China. And, uh, and the Chinese uh, local governments, several local governments have become involved in this as well. There's one, one thing that more I want to talk about the Chinese uh, green public sphere on the global green public sphere and the relationship between these popular and whether or not religious movements and global civil society. I'll give you just one example. In um, the mid 1990s, in the early 1990s, when the Three Gorges Dam was being set up, was being planned and the construction had begun, the surveying had taken place and so on. And uh, the Chinese government had gotten billions of dollars of funding from uh, not just the Western governments, not just IMF and World Bank, but also Morgan Stanley and other investment banks and so on. And uh, there were, of course, murmurs of protests from local scientists and so on, but nothing was, no fuss was made until Dai Ching wrote the book Yang Zi Yang Zi which got translated immediately. And by 1999, when the Chinese government went for the second tranche of its billions of dollars, none of these governments, not the IMF, not the World Bank, not even Morgan Stanley gave it the money because it had been uh, uh, lobbied by uh, environmental groups. Its shareholders had been lobbied, right, and told to avoid this kind of thing. So, I mean, you, you know, you can see how a small little stir can make a huge global scale sort of activism. So it became much more expensive for the Chinese government. And it's still a very dicey project. You know, they claim that the 2008 earthquake, as you've heard, was a consequence of the settling of the reservoir, the final reservoir. And apparently, uh, Poshilai was telling people, if you really go after me, I'll tell people, I'll tell the world how many people are still being resettled from the, Ganges, uh, from the Yangtze Valley and so on. <laughs> apparently, that didn't happen. So, but, uh, and this is happening all over, certainly all over Southeast Asia and the Mekong Delta. You know about Maitzon, the Burmese Irrawaddy thing that canceled, was canceled in 2011 and so on. And Yunnan, of course, is the great cradle of all of these movements. And the Yunnan-Southeast Asian connection is very interesting as a transnational area of activism. So, my final, I hope. Yeah. Um, so, I think that's... So, you have these two different notions of sacrality that are beginning to sort of come together in, 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 a, in an unstable kind of way. One is the sort of religious and, uh, well, actually two. One is the religious, the other is local communities, marginal communities who have a certain conception of nature around them. But the other is the modern sector of civil society and, and civic activism, uh, which also includes a lot of scientists. 
And this is happening through the idea of modern protection. And the best example of this, of course, is the United Nations uh, common heritage of humankind, the protected regions, right? Legally, there are 160,000 legally protected areas in the world, nationally and internationally, including about 1,000 world heritage sites, which are both cultural and natural. More of them are about biodiversity. And it covers 12% of the land area of the world. By the way, this doesn't include the oceans, where most of the a lot of the strangling is taking place. And some studies have shown that they have reduced rates of deforestation, protected species, and conserved land and water. I like to call this a kind of a modern sacrality. Because after all, what is involved here? It's an inviolability, right? When you protect an area, you're saying it's inviolable. And why is it inviolable? Because it is, uh, arises from the elemental urge to protect the sources of life, which is after all what also religious sacrality is often related to. So they are at least partially the legacy of ecological spirituality and ecological activism. National and global legal institutions are beginning to recognize these demands. And we have examples of uh, the Indian Supreme Court who declared that the Urissa cones, uh, where in fact the most bauxite mining in the world takes place, is declared the sacred site of the cones. And so no more mining can happen there. This has, of course, other types of problems. But uh, it's a very interesting development. And there was a rash of other legal protections then that came about at that point, especially with uh, marginal groups with uh, tribal communities and so on. Yunnan also has the sacred sites of the, and the history of that is very interesting. We don't have time to go into it. The three parallel rivers of Yunnan protected areas where activists like Pei Shangji, Yu Xiaokang and so on have created the whole notion of sacred forests. And so so um, okay, I don't think, I, I think uh, my conclusions are, uh, are pretty evident from my uh, talk. So I'll just stop here. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll leave you with this world map with total percentage of each country under natural protection. Yeah, sorry. Thank you so yeah, much. You're and, uh, sorry. Uh, it took a long time. Huh? Oh, well, it's important That's material. And, uh, Is this my glass? I have one. So it might be yours. Yes, you sorry. Too. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So we are on a truncated schedule for uh, complicated reasons having to do with wow. room booking and so on, far more <laughs> detail than you all need. But I, we will be on a, a, a coming to a, a rather abrupt end. Uh, at a, at, we'll need to vacate the room in about 20 minutes. So oh, in order to enough. move with alacrity into the Q&A, I'd like to introduce Michael and ask Michael to begin the discussion. Then after that, we'll open to the floor to uh, questions and comments such as time allows and uh, uh, come to light. Without further ado, Michael. Wonderful. I will be very brief because I do want to open things up for discussion. But let me just say thank you. That was extraordinary. It was both extraordinary in terms of <laughs> all of your work. It's breathtaking. And it's, it's, it's reconceptualization of world history and just the amount of material you bring in. But thank you for another reason, too, because it's also equally true of, your, of all of your work, but now with, with such a, <laughs> an important implication, it's really inspiring. I mean, it, it's, it's one of the few talks I think I've ever heard on the crisis where you come away thinking there is hope. <laughs> and, and, and not just because... I'm always in. The and, and, cup is always <laughs> half full <indeed>. for me. <laughs> and not just in a rah-rah sense, we can really do this. I mean, with a real sense of, no, no, no. I mean, there are actually are movements going on. There really are possibilities. And what seems at the moment like a, a completely overwhelming danger facing us, your argument is, no, that's part and parcel of the dangerous ways we are conceptualizing it. And the dangerous ways we're conceptualizing it are part and parcel of what is going on. And if we that's actually good. alter all of this, <laughs> it, opens up, that <laughs> it opens up everything. So thank you. Thank you for both the brilliant okay. reconceptualization and the feeling, convincingly so, of these possibilities there that are, are really things emergent. happening. There are really things happening. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much for the. I, I have many questions. Oh, I'd sure. love to ask about Shinto, for example, but we'll have other opportunities for that. What I'd like to do in, in order to recognize all of you who have come is open the floor to questions and uh, please raise your hand and let us know who you are as we move ahead. Uh, let's come Bill. right back here. And uh, I'm Catherine Arad. I'm a resident of uh, Cambridge and have been to China many times. Yeah. Um, Often in the United States, when we have a, um, 
an environmental issue uh, that has been caused um, probably maybe by um, uh, manufacturing and other things. The um, push back and forth is not only for the environment, but people say, well, what about the economic improvement of the people that are benefiting by whatever this uh, development is. So how do you tie the two things together, the environmental uh, protection versus the movement forward to people to bettering their economic standing? Uh, should I answer now? Or take oh, yeah. sure, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, I did try to address it in uh, Tim Jackson's uh, view. But of course, that's not an immediate view. That's the long-term view. And, uh, and I don't have a program for, um, uh, or for action here. <laughs> I do have a scholarly view that in the, in the agenda of hum environmental humanities, what I argue is that we should still be looking into issues, you know, the traditional pillars and categories of environmental uh, is, uh, of studies is uh, adaptation, mitigation, uh, political ecology and so on to show who gains and who benefits by certain environmental moves and how the poor are often left out of that, right? So to some extent you can address it through an ecologically informed uh, economic study, right? To address the questions of poverty. Uh, of course there are, you know, uh, policy people who say that you can just do what the Chinese are doing. Uh, well, the positive side of what the Chinese are doing is just build a lot of renewable energy structures and so on that will generate uh, employment and so on too. But ultimately, I think we have to move to the Tim Jackson argument, which is that we have to get rid of the idea that wealth and uh, economics is related only to uh, greater and greater production, that there has to be a diversity of goals and values of what we think of as prosperity, right? Including the ways you use your time, the kinds of activities you do with that, and so on. So I have a three-pronged answer. I don't know if it's satisfactory. Yeah, I think Bill had a question. Yeah, yeah. so we'll come here. Go ahead. Thank you. And uh, it's just wonderful to have a, even a, a iota of optimism in the world uh, on, the, on these issues. On, <laughs> Quite on apart any from issue. half the cup. And, <laughs> but uh, on the China front, I guess I want to press you just a little bit more because uh, I think Taiwan is an example of what can happen, obviously, in a Chinese cultural area. There are a variety and, and extraordinary, yeah. Saji and other uh, organizations have been extraordinarily helpful. Having an opposition party that is a green party yeah. also has something to do with it, but it's in of our course, own of lifetime, course, of course. since the time when you and I as graduate students were in Taiwan, we've seen the physical transformation of this landscape. Absolutely. On the mainland, by contrast, you have obviously things in a quite different way, but the area, if I were to think of where I would be optimistic of where that would head, it's actually, sadly, not because of civil society or because of um, uh, uh, of local activists in, in Yunnan, or as a, it'd be because of the kind of relentless engineering on top, you know, the, the guy who really turned the Ministry of Engineering, uh, I'm sorry, of, uh, of Environmental Protection around, Chen Jining, former president of Tsinghua, uh, you now have a relentless crackdown on uh, uh, coal-fired power plants and so on, all across the country yeah. in terms of uh, uh, production, one size fits all, yeah. And my guess is that this is going to, to the degree that this happens, it will make a dent and a difference faster almost than anything yeah. else. But w the, the civil society part, which is the truly optimistic one of this as a global movement, how do you see this in a world uh, governed by Su uh, Xi Jinping, Xi is, uh, <laughs> uh, and in a world well, in which civil society, and particularly religiously affiliated civil society, is under such pressure. I do, last thing I'll say, I, I remember when he came to power, a, a, a friend of mine, a Buddhist, said to me, you know, don't worry, don't worry about Xi Jinping. He's secretly a Buddhist. Uh, <laughs> he's going to bring the Dalai Lama so back. Mao. Uh, so, <laughs> so give me some hope on that front. 
Well, you know, uh, I think that we are not yet in a position to say that civil society will develop, uh, will flourish in China or something, but I think it does play a role. And uh, while there is a huge crackdown as well under Xi Jinping, I'm not sure it is happening so much in the environmental area. I haven't followed the contemporary scene that much. But uh, certainly there's still all kinds of protests that are going on. Uh, I mean, you're not environmentally related, but land related. And I think that is, uh, that is an important dimension of it. Because when you control the land, I mean, you know, you can sell it off or something. But right now, with the property situation, if people still have, in most parts of China, a share to the land. And they're recognizing that uh, they cannot let that go easily, right? In some parts of South China, they're being transformed into cities and so on, or whatever, these semi-urban uh, uh, residential things. But... Uh, I think there are forces in society, not civil society forces, but forces in society uh, that have not angled it necessarily in an environmental direction, but in a land direction, which I think is an important component. So that's the very long and slow, but you're, you're absolutely right. This is the biggest challenge. And uh, I do think, and, and Xi Jinping is, is uh, working on the gamble, on the bet, the wager, that you know, just having a lot of renewable energy will will do a lot of good stuff, and a lot of geoengineering technical stuff that they're doing as well, and with rivers and so on. Though I think that is going to be uh, another disaster. These are these big projects. So I think the it really is also a rural urban. It's becoming increasingly not only east coastal thing but a rural urban thing, where you can see contamination where you cannot, right? This is a global problem, but it's even bigger in China because it's that much more difficult to see in those places. So, but I don't have a good answer. You're right. That is, that is a, a, a global weakness at this point. Though I, I, I'd be interested in other views. If people are more optimistic about Xi's uh, top-down approach. So I have a question here. I have a number of questions, yeah, and we'll move, yeah. we'll move through. Robin That's will be That's fine. next on the. Okay. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Oh, the mic, so the baton. So I'm disheartened <clears throat> as someone who spent half his professional life in energy efficiency, and the other half in renewable energy, um, and have a deep. I'm sorry, you are, sir. I'm George Wood. <laughs> okay. And um, a deep, abiding commitment to the environment. <clears throat> yeah. I still and, and know the results in New England and the US of these efforts and the huge mountain that we have to climb in, in this country in New England. Um, I've sought, and, and your talk speaks to me, to something that's much bigger and more powerful, and that is to connect with people's spiritual belief. And uh, having read the encyclical three times. And oh, you have. And uh, um, he speaks both to the anger yeah. that a lot of us feel in the environmental movement, to the hope, but also to something you spoke of in your speech, and that is the divine. Divine, yeah. And for me, and I, I would love to hear your thoughts, how do you, who has a much bigger global view than I do, I'm rather New Englandish. How, <laughs> how New do England we, is the world. <laughs> how do we as people and um, get more people like the Pope to proselytize yeah. about the divinity in nature. And I think change from within, right? The, the yeah. spirit, and I, I think that's part of what you're speaking sure, to. Sure. But that to me, uh, I know all the technical solutions. I, 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 I see the actual practical picture but I think the real movement is what you're speaking to, and that's to connect with the divine. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, because I don't think I mentioned this. Uh, precisely at the time when we were in Cambodia doing this, or maybe a little earlier, there was an event in Oslo, which I went to uh, last month, where they gave me an honorary doctorate, but, uh, which was a very interesting event. And the people in Cambodia alerted me to it. It was an interfaith a rainforest movement event. So the Pope sent his representative, direct representative, people from all 
uh, many African, Latin American, Asian societies, as well as, of course, Europeans and Americans, attended that. It was a huge event, uh, supported by the uh, Rainforest Initiative in Oslo. Oslo. By the way, Norway is spending more money than any other for global uh, ecological. I mean, they also dig out the most oil. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, there's a... a but they're also into renewable energy, but they, they're spending it at least, right, too. Uh, and this was a very important one because the statement of it says that rainforests are the principal carbon sinks in the world. And the indigenous people who inhabit those areas are the ones who are suffering most. And it is the duty of the world, the religions of the world, to protect those areas. And it even mentions, you know, who are the uh, ones who are devastating it. Uh, not personally, but industries. So I thought it was, and the Pope had a very important representative. Uh, the Dalai Lama sent his. Uh, there were many Chinese groups, Buddhist groups. Uh, there were many Hindu groups. There were many Muslim groups as well. Uh, so, uh, as, you know, if you're interested, I can send you the link. There's a huge uh, sort of reports on it, uh, and uh, they are uh, now going ahead. I don't know their program of action, but it's been set up, and it's a recognition. Again, like COP21, it's a kind of a landmark, I think, in many ways, for this kind of change, as the spiritual uh, attention to it. Let's see what happens. There are always many good developments <laughs> that we can feel optimistic about. So we, I'd like to come up here and we'll begin with the young woman and then given time we'll move down the line. So thank you. Thank you for your wonderful um, talk. So, but I'm... What's your name? Oh, sorry. So I'm Zeng Wu from Boston University. Um, I'm from China. So it's interesting to see that you connect uh, this uh, ecological thinking or movement to Taoism or Confucianism. But it's a little bit awkward for me to to say that this ecolo uh, ecological thinking is kind of spiritual or religion. Because you know China is kind of secular society, right? Because of uh, communism. So and it took, because I grew up in China, so it took me some time to to understand what is religion when I came to the U.S. And according to my understanding, so transcendence or s sacred, right, is much about the afterlife or another world, uh, which is not this current world, right? So, but you know, this uh, ecological thinking of movement concerns very much about the current world. Yeah. And the thing is that I, I think, I wonder whether we can ar argue things on the other way around, is that instead of the sacri, sacri um, to, sacred, well, to make this relig uh, the ecological thinking as a religion, right? I wonder it is a secularly usage of religion in our secular life, right? That actually make more sense for me instead of making okay. <laughs> uh, it as a spirituality or yeah, religion. And yeah, okay. so so that 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 also bring me uh, about your interpretation about the word Xiangtu. So the interpretation of the word Xiangtu is more as homeland, yeah, right? Yeah, and then so I don't understand why you translate it as sacred land. The part, yeah. No, no, I di I didn't translate it as sacred land. I mean, I added that as another uh, category. It was not a translation. So Xiangtu is, for instance, it's the it's the you know, very interestingly, as Bill knows very well, uh, the, um, the most important pre-war environmental regimes were the Nazis, right? At least in the early phases. And the, the most important concept for their environmentalism and for their political ideology was Heimat. And which is homeland, which is what Xiangtu is. I mean, the Japanese Kyodo, Chinese Xiangtu is really using this German concept with all its uh, metaphysical uh, and originary dimensions. Uh, of course, 
changed as it circulates in different parts. But uh, in Yunnan, this thing has started again, Xiangtu. And that is to say, uh, these environmental groups in Yunnan are, are saying that children who get environmental education in the school are just, you know, they're not interested. They are, it's just something they have to do. Whereas if you involve them in their local communities, in their Xiangtu, and get them to see invasive species and which invasive species are bad, this, that, have them do projects outside and so on, it has much greater effect. It affects them spiritually as well, right? So in that sense. Now to come back to your first part of your question, which is that you're saying that it's more that religion is being instrumentalized, used instrumentally. I would rather not think of it that way. I think the, the concept that I want to use is really pertinence, right? This is the idea I was trying to develop. What is the pertinence between something that had a, may have had other motives but had those qualities and what is the new project? So I would rather not instrumentalize it because it has many creative possibilities. It's not just being used for that one instrumental purpose, right? So. We cannot transcend time and the clock, and I am deeply, we are in deeply, linear deeply time. Sorry, so grateful for a rich talk that has filled our time and filled our evening. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you for your comments. comments.